testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 20, verse 21, King James Bible. Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we continue our study of the whole armor of God and we look at the helmet of salvation in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. The assurance of salvation gives the believer the hope that serves as a helmet of protection and we will delve deeper into that discussion in this study. Meanwhile, you can send your comments, questions, and prayer requests to bbbfohio at yahoo.com, or you can send your letter to P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. And now we begin our study of the Helmet of Salvation in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. This is part one of two. All right, turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, this is good times. Study in the book. Amen? Sometimes it's dead serious. Sometimes it's not. And that fits us well. We're like the old commercials. Sometimes you feel like a nut. And sometimes you go to BBF. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read verses 14 through 17. Then we're going to zero in as we continue our study of the whole armor of God. And I want to open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for everyone here this morning and those watching online. And we just thank you for this book. Amen. We thank you for the fact that we're not alone. It is as it was in the days of Noah, but thankfully, thankfully there's more than just one family. And uh, we're thankful for all the believers all over the world and those here locally. It's a dwindling number. It's a remnant. But we're still thankful for those who do love your book. And because of that book and their faith, uh, their, their faith that comes from that book, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is our focus, Lord. We want to focus on Jesus. We want to love Him as He has loved us. We want to serve Him as He gave Himself for us. And we want to share the wonderful old story of Jesus and His love with the world. And now we just ask, Lord, you help us as we study this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. We're, as I said, still in our study of the whole armor of God. We're coming down to the helmet of salvation. And uh, as I said uh, before we studied, I've studied this a number of times through the years. I've been a Christian for going on uh, 29 years. And um, I've studied this. I've read booklets on it. I, I've, I've uh, been in Sunday school classes and things. And I've walked out just not even really knowing what their point was. Amen. And so uh, I hope that you appreciate our methodical study of this and not just jumping, skipping through and showing you a picture of somebody in armor, but actually helping you understand the spiritual significance and what the point is. We've got several messages already um, on this uh, study and we'll come back to that in a moment. But let's go ahead and open by reading, beginning of verse 14. Read that with me. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This week we're going to zero in on the helmet of salvation. And uh, I want you to know that this is a uh, video of me working really hard in my pastor's study. And as I study this, you can see how intense I am. And that nothing interrupts me except for Jenny. Jenny's the only one allowed to interrupt me. Huh? Yes. That's, that's, a, that's a coat that Jenny got me for Christmas. But, but as I was sitting there studying, I thought, you know, it's really clear for anybody who opens their Bible and reads it and just thinks about it. If you don't wear a helmet, you lose your head. And it's not just in battles. It's not just in fighting. 
Uh, a lot of people die. A lot of people are going to die this year. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet, but I can tell you this. A lot of people are going to die this year because they won't wear a helmet. There are a lot of people on motorcycles who because they want to prove how manly they are or that I'm free, I don't have to wear a helmet, no one's going to tell me to wear a helmet, crash off with their head. Literally, it happens. Decapitation. Others just have their head smashed on the ground. Exactly, or dis disseminated through the county. And that's really the, what you're going to see is that's a simple point that when it comes to losing your head physically without a helmet, this is true spiritually. How many of you know people who once were on fire for the Lord and now are good for nothing? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. They lost their spiritual head. Yeah. And folks, uh, I don't want to be a flash in the pan. I want to serve out this term. We are on the earth for a certain amount of time. Amen. Started in 1989, and I've had some serious, horrible things happen in my life that I've had to deal with. And I've had to sometimes step back a little bit and let go of some things, but the one thing... I haven't done, and the one thing I am intent on not doing is ever turning away from the Lord. Amen. On those times where I had to let go of some things, that was actually because I wanted to reach over and grab a hold a little tighter to the Lord. Amen. And the helmet was first mentioned with the breastplate in Isaiah 59, 17. If you've seen the other studies or you've been here for the other studies, You'll see that this is a passage we quoted before. In Isaiah 59, 17, it's talking about the Lord. For He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon His head, and He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. And it was clad with zeal as a cloak. Yeah. That's something? First mention. The helmet of salvation upon His head. And we've studied in this study of the armor of God, we talked about the girdle of truth. The world does not believe in truth. We believe in truth. Amen. We have the truth in this book. Amen. And Jesus said, I am the way, the, the life. Jesus is truth incarnate. And uh, when you gird yourself with that basic foundation, then you're ready to then put on the other pieces of armor. The breastplate of righteousness does not say the breastplate of self-righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ Amen. that you know that you are being saved, as I quoted I think earlier in prayer, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Amen. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, we are being saved by His righteousness. And if that's what you put in on your breastplate, as, it's, as it says, it's that, if that's what you are surrounding yourself and your heart with, then you will be safe from those darts coming at your chest, Amen. coming at your heart. But if you are walking in self-righteousness, you're just going to be cut down. Just a matter of time before you're cut down. We also studied the uh, feet, having the feet shod or shooed with the gospel of peace. That means you're, you're stable, you're standing. It's a covering for the soul of the feet. The soul. <laughs> and you are standing firm and you are prepared and ready to preach the gospel. A Christian who is not thinking of that, a Christian whose life is not uh, moved by the desire to see souls saved and to preach the gospel is a baby Christian. If you are caught up in something else, you are either an infant spiritually or you're acting like an infant spiritually. Yeah. You, you can be distracted, but that, be, being distracted like that, it's like a baby. Gloria, pay attention. Stop it. <laughs> Look, see? And she did for about two seconds. That's what spiritual infants do. We expect that out of Gloria, my little Amish baby this morning. <laughs> Yeah, but God does not expect that out of you. Amen. He wants you to grow and be mature. 
Be ready with your feet shod with the gospel of peace. And then we looked at the shield of faith. Shield, the shield of faith is something that doesn't just protect the breastplate, but it actually is a protector of everything we've studied above. And we talked all about that. We showed these pictures of the uh, Roman garb and how it protected the, uh, the loin and protected the heart, your feet prepared, and that, sh that shield that you could actually hide behind in the sense of being protected from the fiery darts of the wicked. And uh, we won't re-preach all that, but on, on top of that, settling on your head is this helmet of salvation. Now, <laughs> as cute as that is, that's not what I'm talking about. But I had to show that. Somebody sent me that and said, hey, you're teaching on that next week. That's not really what I'm teaching on. Actually, it was made, uh, more like this. And I think that most of the Roman soldiers, they, they probably didn't have it quite that shiny. I don't know. They, were, they just were always fighting. And it was things hitting them on the head and leaving dents and, and everything. So it probably wasn't that, quite that shiny and perfect looking. But that gives you an idea of the helmet. And uh, if you notice when we've shown you pictures that a good soldier left very little target. Why? Because you're no good if you're hit. And so it wasn't just the soldier, but it was the actual leaders, the generals, those over the soldiers who wanted them to have this armor on because they were no good to them dead. <laughs> and so... In a spiritual sense, God is telling us all about this armor because you're no good to Him dead. And you can be spiritually dead even though you're alive right now. You can be spiritually dead. And that just probably describes the majority of professing Christians today. That's why the uh, old uh, preacher looked out on the crowd and said, I have good news. This church will be the first to go at the rapture because it says the dead in Christ will rise first. <laughs> As a good point, if you're talking to people who you believe are spiritually dead, a headshot is deadly. And so the helmet of salvation, obviously God is talking about something that is, is just beyond important as far as your spiritual walk. So what's it say? Well, you should always wear a helmet when riding your motorcycle in the office. Is that the point? No. Giants were slain by headshots. Does that remind you of a story? 1 Samuel 17, 49 says, And David put his hand in his bag and took there a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. What was it that Goliath did wrong? He didn't wear a helmet. And if he did wear a helmet, it was evidently not protecting the forehead. He left too much open. And so David took him down. What was it you said earlier, Johnny, about David and Goliath that... Uh, That was Goli what Goliath thought when he got hit. Yep. <laughs> Nothing like this has entered my head before. Now, I just want to warn you, just for the sake of you seeing this, uh, I want to show this. It may be too graphic for some. You might want to cover Gloria's eyes here. There. So he had a space uncovered, and that's what David aimed at, and that's what David hit. In this case, that's good. But you know, your enemy is going to be looking for that. And if you leave a space open, he's going to go for it. So a little reality check before we move on. The primary purpose of the helmet was to ward off de deadly blows from the enemy. That's the primary purpose as Paul is using the reference to a helmet and armor. It's to ward off deadly blows from the enemy. And that's a great 
picture because that was the purpose of the helmet in war. And so it demonstrates or pictures that reality very well. And nothing wards off the blows of Satan like the hope of salvation. Uh, Doug and I were talking earlier. There are good Christian people. Listen, you, you can, thank God that you can be saved and be a heretic. You can. There are going to be a lot of heretics in heaven. Amen. You don't have to agree with that. It's true. Uh, there are a lot of heretics. You know, do you know John Wesley was a heretic? Did you know that? He taught people that they could lose their salvation. He actually corrected the King James Bible. He held heresies. His idea of sanctification is heretical. But I believe John Wesley's in heaven because the Bible says you're not saved by being doctrinally correct. You're saved by believing how that Christ died for our sins and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day. John Wesley gives a plain account of his repentance toward God and his faith in that gospel. Now, some of his doctrine was wrong after that. It was heretical, but he's in heaven. And that's why I tell you, when you go out here and you talk to people who may not be doctrinally sound, if they are gospel-believing Christians, you can still have fellowship with them. But where we draw the line is, you're not going to teach that stuff in this church body. You're not going to teach that stuff in my family, in my home. And if you try to push it on me, I'm going to push back. Amen. That's the biblical way of handling that. But those poor people who I'm talking about who don't believe in security, they believe they can lose their salvation, they're the ones who on this issue, they're the ones you see most often taking a deadly blow to the head spiritually. You'll see when trouble comes along, some of them think they've lost their salvation. Yeah, Charlie? Another thing that's really important is if you don't know your like, if you're, if you're not confident in your salvation. Yeah, that's what I mean is by the helmet of salvation, you're not going to put it on if you're not confident in that helmet. If you're not confident in your salvation, the helmet's not going to seem important to you. And there are stories all over the uh, history books as you read through history of people who just thought, ah, this isn't really important, and then it ended up being the thing that got them killed. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Just a few pages over from where we're at. Right after Colossians. And right before 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, begin verse 6. I'm going to actually begin in verse uh, 4, read a couple of verses. It says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Verse 6 says, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now keep, uh, begin reading there. Read verses 7 and 8 with me. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now folks, if there's ever a generation where this text should be preached, it's now. We are in these days, he's talking about in the context of verses 1 through 3, but of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. This is in the context of the approaching tribulation. And I believe we are just a little over seven years from the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
And I always will say that because Jesus comes at the end of seven years. That begins when the Antichrist confirms the covenant with many for one week. And that happens sometime after the rapture. And the rapture is imminent. The rapture could happen any moment. So every day that you wake up in the morning, you could look in the mirror, or you don't have to look in the mirror, just talk to yourself. And say, self, today could be the day for the rapture. And that means that Jesus' return when He conquers Antichrist and sets up His kingdom is something just a little over seven years if the rapture happens today. Amen. And He's telling you, you that are living in this day now, God doesn't want you sleeping through this. <laughs> Do you see that? Verse 7, read that again. Or that, read, read verse 6. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The majority of Christians that I have known today are in complete rebellion against that verse. And as a matter of fact, they try to talk me into backsliding with them. Why do you keep up with what's going on like that? Why do you care? Why do you just I don't believe God wants us to do that. I believe that God just wants us to be happy and enjoy our lives and then we go to heaven. Well, that's strange that you think God wants that since He's told you the opposite. <laughs> Who's this God you speak of? Amen? Who is this God you're talking about? The God of the Bible says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Amen. The Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, we uh, have quoted often, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Yeah. There were plenty of Jews back in the Old Testament time leading up to the captivity who had no idea what was going on. They didn't read the prophets and they didn't listen to the prophets. They just went on their merry way. As long as I'm happy, that's all that matters was their statement of faith. And folks, I'm telling you, that is a horrible attitude. If you're here this morning and you don't know what's going on in the world around you, shame on you. And you're going to be ashamed when you stand before the Lord. And it's not... It, here's, here's the thing I always come back to. It, it, people who do that, they think it's all about them. They have a self-centered focus. We are to be focused on God... And the only way to do that is in His Word. And as you focus on His Word, you see this, and it says, but let us watch and be sober. Well, then what should you do? Watch and be sober. See how easy God has made it? You know the only problem you have if you have a problem with this this morning? You. You're the only problem. God has made it so clear that even Charlie got it. I'm just kidding. But it, it, is that as clear as it gets? And yet, how many Christians just go through life not watching? And it says, be sober. How many Christians you know? It, it's, it's not a play on words there. The next verse is, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But it's not just booze. How many Christians you know? are going through life medicated. I don't mean medicine that they need. I mean medicated so that they don't know what's going on in the world around them. They're just kind of walking around like, hey, praise the Lord. How many of you, do you know people like that? I do. We went out visiting in the neighborhood and there were a few people that I wanted to ask them if they knew what year it was. They just had this glossy, glass-eyed look about them. And 
smiled, and just talked to me. And then if that baby turned out, I mean, you know, yeah. Well, thanks. Here you go. We'll see you later. I mean, because you can't talk to people who are drunk. You can't talk to people who are jacked up on psych meds and things that they shouldn't be taking. But that's what we're dealing with today. Yeah. The young people. I, I, I try to talk to the young people and they've got them all jacked up with this anti rid or it's called Ritalin, right? Yeah. That's at least the, what, it, probably other things now. And these kids are just high. And it's, you can't talk to people about the Lord when they're high. And I don't care if it came through the pharmacist or if it came from the guy on the street. That's what we're dealing with. This, this opioid, is that how you pronounce that? Yeah. Opioids. Yeah. Heroin is huge. And I understand that if you have a problem with opioids and you can't get your hands on that, then they turn to heroin because it, it has a, a similar effect or something. Fentanyl. Fentanyl? Yeah. Now, you may think I'm going on about nothing. Wake, hello? I'm trying to wake you up to a reality. This is the world you live in. You're trying to preach the gospel to a bunch of people who are, for all sakes, uh, I guess scientifically you could actually say they're practically brain dead. Their brains are not functioning. You're trying to talk to a wall. And what do you, what do, you do? You know what you do? Obey the Lord. Keep watching. Keep trying to talk to people. You come across somebody that looks high as a kite, give them a gospel track and hope they read it when they wake up. Hey folks, in 1988, that's where I was. 1988, I was high. You say, when? 1988. No, I mean when? I mean 1988. I don't remember 1988. But people preached to me. And they would, they would say things. And when I'd sober up, I'd sit and stare at the ceiling. I don't believe that. But what if it is true? Because they do have moments. And then that thing's laying there that some guy gave them. And they reach over and pick it up and read it. You see what I'm saying? But this is part of watching and being sober. It's for you to realize the world we're living in and what we're dealing with. And it says in the next verse then, going hand in hand, you, you think I'm on a rabbit trail, I'm not. It goes hand in hand with the next verse. What does verse 8 then say? But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for in helmet the hope of salvation. Why is it? There are numerous reasons why. Number one, if you don't have that helmet on, and you're dealing with these people, it can get discouraging. Mm -hmm. And then you see Christians, one after another, falling up by the wayside. It can get discouraging. Yes. Preachers falling by the wayside. It can get discouraging. Yeah. Amen. Well, if you've got your hope in some other preacher, some, pre I mean, any preacher. That includes me. Don't put your hope in me. Amen. You have your hope in some church you attend. You have your hope in people in general, or maybe it's even your own parents or your brothers, your sister, somebody you think, oh, but they're they're the real deal. There's a, you should not have your hope in them. Amen. But so many people put their hope in these things. Now, I'm not going to name all the things, but I sit here, I can tell you all the people that, including, I will say this, the first two men who took me under their wing, basically, to mentor me. You picture this. Coming out of what I did, just been saved a few months. Guy takes me under his wings, gets nailed, cheating on his wife. And then shortly after that, same thing, it happens again.